cool thing about time series data is it is coming from places where we don't normally think of data. It's kind of this new era that's happening. This isn't web. This isn't, uh, um, this isn't uh, banking applications. But we really see it uh, emerging in many places. This is, we're in New York. This is uh, financial tick data. Um, but it's also when we think of system monitoring, uh, we have our machines starting talking with massive amounts of, uh, of, of time series data. Uh, a lot of this actually also comes from old areas. You know, if you think about transportation and logistics, if you track every location of a car or container and you want to make planning decisions, you want to look how your assets are moving, this is again time series data. We see this in, in AI and industrial machines and this whole area called predictive maintenance. And of course with things like web and event. So we have this question of that time series data seems to be emer emerging everywhere. Uh, the interesting thing we found is when we started talking to people about we're a time series database, in the beginning there was actually a lot of confusion of what that actually means. Because actually if you look at a lot of the NoSQL time series databases on the market right now, they actually all mean a very specific thing that's much more narrower than the problem of time series data in general. So let me spend a minute just talking about what we mean. And if you think kind of abstractly about something like IoT, which is a bunch of devices generating a lot of data, kind of there's some unique characteristics of these data streams. One is that they're putting out these amounts of data. If you look here, I'm trying to show this illustration where different sensors or different sensor types are putting out the streams of data. And in particular, data is generally getting written to the latest time. It's, a, it's very insert heavy workload. And we'll come back to why that's important in a minute. Now, if you look at a lot of time series databases, they have a very specific way of storing this. And if you ask them, they would say, I have, let's say, they'll say, I have 200 time series. And what they mean by that is if they would define a time series as a particular metric, like a CPU, associated with a set of tags, a unique set of tags. So here, if you look at this picture, I have a bunch of times, I have a bunch of metrics, and then I have a bunch of combinations. And you might look at this and say, I have about 10 time series here. And if you think about it that way, the number of time series is actually the combinatorial grow, grows combinatorial with the number of unique tags you have. Now, of course, this isn't the only way to store it. Uh, and, and going back to this, what happens, a lot of people build very efficient architectures where they store these column formats. Uh, and you know, that's the only type of analysis they could efficiently do. But in many cases, you don't just have these narrow rows. You have a lot of fields together. And so my example here is imagine you're doing uh, cold chain monitoring. You have a bunch of container ships. And it's great if you could store temperature, humidity, and CPU average. But it's also important that you understand the relationships. Because for example, if your temperature peaks, is this because your in fact refrigerated car is no longer working? Or is it because for some reason you have a bug and your CPU is locked at 100 and all you're doing is measuring the radiant temperature of your CPU? So these relationships are important. And again, it's something to think about when we design time series databases. And the other thing is a lot of times we additionally have additional measurement or metadata. So for example, it's important to know that we have containers, but often we want to know what's inside those containers. And this is the traditional relational model of time series data. It's very important that we know that, for example, our frozen food is not being refrigerated when my electronics are probably fine with that. And so what we want to think about is how do we build a time series database that could solve all of these not just single metrics, but also support a rich relational model, because in many cases, that's what people were actually, the richer types of questions they want to ask were related to this. Today, a lot of times what happens people is they store their time series data in one database and their relational data in, in another database, and they kind of punt the problem up to the application layer. Now, this is great for the employment of application developers, but if you think about it, the main purpose of the database is to ease with data management. It doesn't really help you that much there. And sometimes when an analyst wants to ask a new question, it means that they need to get the engineers you know, in, in an engineering sprint three months from now to add this to a sprint so they could now ask a new type of query that joins across these two databases. And so you might say, well, is this necessary? Why don't people just use relational databases? And in fact, if you ask a bunch of people what they're using, what we found, this is a, a survey by Percona uh, last year, more than two thirds said they were using a NoSQL database. And so the question we had is, if this inhibited a lot of this type of analysis, which you might want to do, why so much NoSQL? No that is, why not use a simple relational database? So one of the things is if you try to fire up, you, I asked about another great database like Postgres, if you try to fire up standard Postgres, trying to store all this data, all this time series data in a, in a, in a Postgres table, 
what you'll see is things start looking well. This is inserts per second. This is doing inserts row by row. Clearly, it, and I'll show you, it's a lot more efficient if you do batches of inserts, but row by row. Uh, things look happy at, at first, but once the database gets a little big, things kind of go off a cliff, right? And we see this big plunge, a uh, large variance, and sometimes you're getting on the order of a few hundred inserts per second. What's happening is you're trying to index this data. Your indexes are not all staying in memory. And so now when you're inserting a piece of data into your database, basically, you need to maintain a separate B tree for each of these dimensions. And then when you insert it, you need to update that B tree, which means a lot of swapping back and forth to disk. And that's why we see this big performance. So memory is, memory is good, disk is bad. Not so surprising, but ultimately the nature of time series data was we have a lot of it, and so clearly we want to exceed the, be able to exceed the capacity of the entire database fully in memory. So you could say, why don't we just use NoSQL? That's what a lot of people have seemed to do. And generally, NoSQL databases have turned to these uh, data structure called log structured merge trees, which have made inserts quicker because they don't actually always store a global uh, sorted order over disks. They keep these independent, what they call uh, uh, ind independent uh, uh, sorted uh, sequences, and then write them to disk as a batch. And then in the background, they slowly merge that together. Now, this is, a, and in fact, this is the approach taken by most NoSQL databases. And so this actually leads to higher insert rates, um, but the problem is it often leads to very high in-memory indexing. So the reason a lot of these things talk about the number of time series is they basically will start keeping these separate data structures for each of these unique time series. And so if the number of time series grows as a combinatorial, as the combination between all these different unique sets of tags, these things will, if you have a million different device IDs, a thousand locations, and ten different data types, this is already 10 billion separate time series, and this database can't handle that. So it kind of limits in how you can do. And they also have another limitation, like no joins, and the whole loss of a lot of the SQL ecosystem. So instead of asking this question, is there a better way to build this? And that's what we set out to do with time TimescaleDB, DB, which is a scalable time series database that provides full SQL. At a high level, we provide three goals. Uh, and the first is that we really provide full SQL. So windowing, subqueries, CTEs, uh, joins, anything you have in SQL, you can basically do in time, in, in time scale. On top of that, we add a bunch of time-oriented features, uh, and this allows you to then have one database that basically ha stores both your relational data and your time series data, so you can move all these joins into the database. And, but the last interesting thing is that we expose the abstraction of what looks like a single table. And what that means is that if you have any existing tool that could speak to Postgres, this is anywhere from like an ORM like Ruby to something very enterprisey like Tableau or Microsoft Power BI, it will just work with uh, timescale out of the box. The second thing, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, is it supports high write rates and a bunch of time-oriented optimizations uh, to the extent that on a single node we have people running at hundreds of billions of rows uh, per node and uh, maintain that high, uh, high insert performance. And the last thing, which is pretty important for us, is that we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants, which is Postgres, that we've been somewhat careful to keep the lowest level of storage native to Postgres, and so effectively inherent that inherent reliability that Postgres has developed over the last 20 years. Okay, so the big question is, how do we take an existing database like Postgres and make it scalable for time series data? And the key insight is that time series workloads are actually a different problem than traditional OLTP workloads. In particular, if you look at these traditional transactional workloads, you primarily have updates. You know, you have a Bank of America, let's say, has 50 million customers. That data, that number of customers is not that big. But often you go in and you, like, will exchange money between accounts. So it might be thought of as an update to one account and a change to another account in one form of transactions. Primary updates, the writes are randomly distributed. You're touching random user IDs and you often have these transactions to multiple primary keys. When in time series, we typically have these inserts, right, and these inserts are typically, this append-only workload, are typically to the recent time interval. And these writes are typically associated with this, with timestamp and some other data, but not randomly distributed, not kind of transactions to multiple. And so what we'll see is we can take advantage of the fact that it's a very append-only or append-heavy workload. So if we look back at our picture, one of the key ways that timescale is architected, 
that if you think about this as your data model, as these are kind of new sensor readings or new financial tick data coming in, then we provide the abstraction of what we call as a hypertable. And to the outside world, this hypertable looks like a single table, but under the covers, it is actually partitioned in one or more ways. Uh, the first thing is by time. You could build a bunch of partitions. And these time intervals could be specified manually, like hourly or minutely or daily. Or the system, the database also has a way to dynamically adjust these intervals based on the data volumes to provide the good result. And just to give you, you know, a foreshadowing, some people will say, well, don't they do partitioning already in something like Postgres 10 or other databases? I'll show you, we're talking about at, at performance where the database will automatically generate a new partition even every several minutes. And we'll be dealing with tens of thousands of these partitions at, on any single node. So it's very different from like traditional manual partitioning you would have in a database. The second thing is you could do this in terms of some space where uh, often commonly we'll do interval or hash partitioning in space. A common thing is if you have many different devices, you want to separate them again to get these to the good sized chunks. And we call these as chunks. What they are stored at the lowest level is actually just an internal table inside Postgres. But from the outside world, the user will only see this hyper table. So your inserts and your queries and your constraints and your triggers and your upserts and uh, anything else you deal with the database will actually all be done by the hyper table. You won't actually be dealing with chunks at all. But under the covers, what this hyper table is going to do is figure out, or even schema management, alter schema will all be in terms of the hyper table. Under the covers, it's going to be uh, figure out how to properly route and search the right chunk, how to do efficient queries over which precise small set of chunks it wants to touch, how do I uh, map proper constraints to these dis disjoint set of chunks, how do I properly do upserts, and so forth. And if you look at visually, what will happen is as more data gets, gets come in, these chunks will naturally be created, and as kind of new time intervals appear, the database is going to naturally, dynamically create these more chunks, possibly sized adaptively, and, and map the new data against them. And as an example of why that's important and why kind of manual partitioning doesn't work, for example, uh, a a user saying, you know, we inserted 500 billion rows into what looks like a single table on a single node, and basically we maintain the type of performance. So here they're getting 400,000 inserts per second at 500 billion rows. And interestingly, at the end, basically the database was dynamically creating a set of chunks every five minutes and had about 50,000 chunks internally. So this is really beyond what you're going to uh, see in uh, any other database that we know about. Let me talk about why you get some of these chunks, why you get some of these benefits. The first big idea here and how we do this adaptive sizing and what people think when they manually tune it is that we want to make chunks to be right sized. And what that means is that the recent chunks, in recent in time, will basically all very naturally fit in memory. And because indexing is all local to the chunks, what that means is these indexes themselves are small. And so whatever you need to even update the index when you insert new data, it's again updating this very small index that's naturally maintained in memory. And so without kind of redoing this entire database and losing any of their other functionality, we can naturally get this type of behavior, but precisely because of the nature of time series workloads, that these are insert heavy to the recent time intervals rather than updates randomly distributed over all of your data. The second thing this leads to, which again is very important in many time series applications, is efficient retention policies. So for example, a thing that's somewhat common is I'm only going to keep raw data for let's say a week or a month, and then I'm going to keep aggregates for longer periods of time. And typically in, in a single table, this would actually involve a delete query that would end up remove uh, individual rows from a table. This would cause fragmentation. That itself would be slow. And then also vacuuming to basically defrag it would also be slow. Because of these type of chunks, you could set data retention policies or run efficient commands that basically say, drop the chunks whose all of whose data is older than this period. And that's basically just deleting a file on disk as opposed to removing individual rows as part of a table. And the interesting thing about this chunking design is that it's kind of the same basic architecture for queries as we have for single node and as we are as we release next year for the clustered version. In particular, one of the things that it also allows us to, even on a single node, to scale up by adding many disks. 
And you could do this either through RAID or also in Postgres through table spaces where you could have many table spaces on a single table, on a single hyper table. Which people who are familiar with Postgres, usually a table space effectively is a mount point, so you have to map usually a table to a single mount point in your file system, right? But here we could have one hyper table is just an abstraction over many tables. And so as you're basically elastically adding disks, which is particularly powerful in a cloud environment where you can network attach these disks, you could basically these new time intervals which, which get created get load balanced all, over all of the disks that you have subsequently added. This leads to both faster inserts and also allows you to parallelize queries over these different disks. The second thing is that kind of a technique under development is that this is the same sh uh, kind of sharding technique and chunking technique that uh, also takes us to distributed environments, where now rather than these shards being on a single machine or across many disks, they're actually on many servers as well. Because already our query planner is actually doing transactions across touching many of these chunks at the same time. What this will allow you to do is insert a query to any server as well as distribute query optimizations like pushing down limits and aggregations and various other things. So the other thing this allows us to do is not just on how it maintains this high insert rate, but also leads us to do various chunk aware query optimizations, particularly where we have kind of semantic knowledge of time, which a normal database doesn't think about. One thing this allows us to do is kind of very aggressive constraint exclusion. So for example, given these large numbers of chunks, and again, you have 50,000 chunks, naively what something like Postgres will do is when you have, they allow this thing called table inheritance, when you query the parent, it's actually going to run the same query against all the children. That's okay if you have 10, 10 children. It's a very different thing if you have 50,000 children, right? But our, the way we build this allows us to, given kind of tie into the query planner, to given a particular query, we can look at this, calculate the constraints, recognize that this interval only covers a few chunks, and then only be able to push down the query to those chunks. Similarly, we could push down to a particular device, where here it selected a particular device in space partitioning, or kind of push gram slice across time. And, or, or support a higher number of dimensions as well. Now the interesting question is this is, again, thinking about time has allowed us to do certain optimizations. So, for example, does anybody know the difference between these two queries? Yeah, well, one says now, the other one seems to static. Um, this, unfortunately, Postgres can't handle well. And the reason being is because this type of function is done in the, uh, this uh, function is not, if you do prepared statements, it's not gonna be executed till execution. And the planner actually works at prepared statements. This is even trickier if you're dealing with the timestamp. Even if this wasn't now and was a fixed time, it might not know if you've done that at prepared time if the system time has changed between when the, the query was planned or prepared and when it was actually executed. So if you do this in SQL, for, in Postgres, for example, this again will give up on constraint exclusion and will touch all the query. But again, because we optimize for time, we move a lot of this logic from the planner into actually our execution engine, and then we'll properly um, do aggressive constraint exclusion wherever we can. Again, there's various things that, things that we do because we are focused on time series analysis that Postgres natively won't. So the second thing you'd ask, that seems great, it has some scale, is this just about time? And I, and I touched about some of these before, which is that the one thing this allows you to do is kind of operationally, this moves from this world where you have a separate relational database and a NoSQL database to something where you're running one Postgres instance and joining between these two types of data. Another thing that we kind of add is as, again, we're focusing on time series analysis, we kind of add additional analytics. So this is a, one of the blog posts that one of our interns wrote last summer. Uh, and actually, this is a cool intern project. In her first couple of weeks, she wrote this, learned SQL to do it, and then became, kind of went number one on Hacker News, and I think it was read 100,000 times. Um, but what her analysis was doing, uh, of course it was about cryptocurrency, because that's what Hacker News cares about. But what she was doing was she was taking advantage of a lot of these functions that we added, or really UDFs that we added about time series analysis that you don't find in traditional Postgres. And as we're going on, we're adding kind of more and more of these type of analysis. The nice other thing about uh, Timescale is because it is implemented as a Postgres extension, it actually plays well with other Postgres extensions. So a very, uh, fairly common type of analysis 
is to do geospatial temporal analysis. That is, let's actually look about both geospatial analysis then coupled with time. So this is actually a type of query that is very similar to what of our kind of financial customers use. That you could take a region, for example, this is, this is using the PostGIS extension, and do this kind of fancy geometries and polygons and whatever, but also think about the time component as you do as well. And yet do all this constraint exclusion across these chunks that you don't get in just one big table. So there's thing about a 10x improvement when they were able to go from this single table model to this heavily chunked model. And the last thing you get, and I kind of alluded to this already, is things like data retention policies and aggregates that you could have, again, have one hypertable with raw data, you might set a retention policy like a week, another uh, hypertable with, let's say, 15 minute aggregates with different retention policies. And a key important thing, too, is the way you actually do this is you take advantage of the fact that we have really built in uh, support for upserts. So upserts, for people who aren't familiar, is insert the row if it's new, otherwise you could update an existing row. And what this allows you to do is kind of be a little sloppy with late data. One of the problems with doing these aggregates is what happens if I finish, uh, let's say, five minute interval, I compute an aggregate, and then a piece of data comes in late, right? It goes back and touches that old five minute interval that I already computed the aggregate for. What you kind of want to do is compute this windowed form where we recompute things that have already been touched, but the ability to do upserts means that you're not having spurious records in your database. Again, something like traditional Postgres table inheritance doesn't do this correctly. It can't actually handle this constraints correctly, but this is all something that we've engineered fairly carefully to work in our hypertable model. And the kind of I allude to this already is that because, again, our hypertable just looks like standard tables, if you use any one of these existing tools, it will just work out of the box. Uh, Grafana was perhaps a nice addition just two weeks ago, launched a Postgres uh, connector. Now, uh, I do want to actually obviously mention a little bit about performance. So you saw some of this graph before, and this was still doing these single row inserts, which anybody who's running a database could tell you is not the fastest way to build one. But the nice thing is Postgres goes off the cliff, and because of this chunking architecture, kind of time scales maintains this very consistent performance. Now, if you take that a little bit further, um, by the way, this goes back to 250 million rows. Uh, and, and you'll see that I, I include metrics per second because if you come from the time series database, no SQL time series database world, Sometimes you report the number of individual metrics you insert per second, not the number of rows. Uh, and so here, kind of, these are 10, 10 columns per row. Now, if you extend this to larger batch sizes, so here's the database going to a billion rows. Um, Postgres is, again, really good when everything fits in memory and then goes off the cliff. Right? Where in time scale kind of maintains this pretty consistent performance until you basically see this 20x performance gap between you know, using time scale or, or natively using Postgres. Or something on the order of, of a million or, we've had people, do, you know, it depends a lot on hardware. This is a kind of a standard box in Azure, um, yeah, what you might normally use. Now, it's not just insert side. There's a lot of improvements on the query sides as well. Um, anything between kind of simple, uh, uh, that should be table scan, simple table scans. I don't know exactly what happened there. Um, the, the rough of the same are some 20% faster, uh, group buys being something like uh, 2x faster, or a very common thing in time series data, which we call up here time-oriented group buys, would be something like, uh, give me the average metric every five minutes, ordered by time descending, you know, limit whatever, limit a, limit a week. And again, the output of that aggregate over five minutes is a function so, so Postgres doesn't know how to order it natively, so you have to compute a law, all of it before it actually computes the ordering and limits. When, because time scale has a semantic knowledge of what these, that these functions are operating on time and what they mean, we can do a lot more efficient things and get some kind of ridiculous, you know, 10,000 times faster than native Postgres was. And these are kind of the, the data retention policies being as well. Now, some of you might ask who are very familiar with Postgres could say, what about Postgres 10? As in Postgres 10, really improve the thing with, uh, uh, with declarative partitioning. Uh, Postgres 10 did indeed make things somewhat better. Um, if you do batch inserts, uh, the red line is time scale, the blue line is PG10. Or if you're trying to go back to single row inserts, um, Postgres 10 didn't really solve the problem. 
Now the main difference is again, in a traditional database, you often will create a partition per day or per, per month. You're not trying to think about how do I make my system efficient for handling 50,000 partitions on a single node. The other question you might ask is what about NoSQL? And again, turns out that Postgres in its own face is engineered pretty robustly. Again, some of these NoSQL databases. So again, we're seeing about a 10x performance improvements against Cassandra. And similarly, uh, a whole bunch of uh, speed ups in terms of queries as well. Anything from simple scans being two to 40 times faster to again these time order group buys being close to 2,000 times faster. Um, last point is a very common query in IoT. It's something like, tell me the last record you have from every unique device in your, in your system. It's pr pretty common. And again, um, the nice thing, interesting thing about that is we've had people who actually replaced a small cluster of Cassandra nodes with a single instance of time scale using standards replication for HA. Now, the one question is I, I talked about all this partitioning and, and, and fancy stuff. How difficult is that to actually deploy? And I think my point is, you know, our goal is to be very opinionated databases. We don't want people to be manually thinking about how they set up all this. We just want them to give them what looks like a table and to have everything magically happen under the covers. So basically, if you have time series data which you store in a traditional Postgres database, your migration process is the following. You create a table, or you can do create table data like your other table. You run this one magic command which says create this hyper table, convert this table into this hyper table we're talking about, Time here is the, is the inter interval columning. You could do a little fancy if you want, but this is the simplest version. And there. You've now migrated your table into a hyper table. So if people would like to more, uh, learn more or, or download, check it out. Uh, we are open source, Apache 2. You can download it from GitHub. Um, and I would like to end this by saying we are actually located 70 blocks south of here, uh, right near Grand Central. Uh, and we are hiring a whole bunch of different areas, core database engineers, R&D support engineers, or if there's not something on the board that you don't see but you might be interested in, come talk to me. Otherwise, thanks for your time. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, so questions, have we benchmarked against KDB? Um, we haven't. Um, Partly our lack of KDB licensing, um, uh, and possibly terms of use. But I think the big thing we find, and we do talk to a bunch of financial firms, um, KDB is super optimized for in memory, really keeping things in L2, relatively small data sets, uh, column oriented. I imagine on very simple column roll ups, they are faster. But uh, what they lack is basically SQL. And so when we talk to a lot of people, um, the choice is not KDE versus us in terms of how fast can you roll up a single tick stream. It's more, I have these whole set of tools that I can't have my organization use because there's only five people who know, or, who know how to write queue. Yeah, so I mean, what you're seeing is SQL is making this big uh, resurgence uh, across a whole variety of things. Um, one place that has happened has uh, been for streaming systems. So uh, Kafka just announced KSQL. If you look at the big growth in Spark streaming, it's, it's Spark SQL. I think the big difference is they are largely operating on windowing functions. So the idea of SQL on a stream processor is you define a window function, you shoot data through it, and every, you know, you compute aggregates, you emit them to something else. You often use that for, um, you know, in place real time roll ups or use that for things like um, alerting anomaly detection. Uh, we often see us used in a different scenario, which is that people are trying to um, build somewhat operationalized or kind of data warehouse or analytical workloads. Um, some of this could be streaming, people have used this, but for that type of scenario. But the big thing is they want to touch historical data. And they, or they want to power dashboards where uh, you want to take aggregates over different periods, or you have a real time view, and sometimes you want to go back in time and look more at data and allow you to do ad hoc queries. Um, we see these two things as both important things in the market, and we kind of 
uh, people, people have actually used a story complementary to a stream processing engine or Kafka, which then feeds time scale that then serves a, a, a query or a visualization layer. Does time scale work with other Postgres extensions, such as Citus or such, HLL? Such as Citus. Hi, Oscar. Um, do you know? I, I, actually, I could ask you the same. Um, I, I, so I imagine that uh, time scale absolutely works with many Postgres extensions. I said PostGIS. Um, what I don't know is, is Citus. Uh, we have not tested it yet. You're also welcome to do the same. Um, I, I think we both, I, I think the question is how we, I know, I know unlike many Postgres extensions, we both integrate pretty deeply and take over the query planner. Um, so it, it effectively, I think it means more how we trample on each other's feet. But um, we should do that. Okay. Uh, let me okay. try to see if there's other, uh, in the back. I will repeat the question. I apologize for forgetting that. Um, uh, the, 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 the gentleman's question I answered before was asking about how does this compare to streaming, uh, to, to various SQL that's um, uh, emerging of stream processing, and the previous question was how does uh, timescale compare to, K, uh, to uh, KDB? Um, so I have a question around the metadata. So when you're inserting into tables where you really don't have any assumptions about the structure of the metadata and you in, in essence have like multiple time series, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so it's interesting that you, I mean, the, the phrasing again, you have multiple time series, I, th I think is a little bit from a particular, particular world. Um, what we find is that uh, as something that builds on Postgres, we support kind of all the capabilities of Postgres. And so what that means is we have full kind of JSON and JSONB support as well, as well as GIN indexing and all the indexing you get on JSON as well. And so we have people use us in a variety of ways. One is they store us kind of in narrow form. Uh, one is they store us in wide form, denormalized and wide. And again, it depends a little bit on your data model. Some they actually have separate metadata tables that they will join against the more time series tables. Uh, sometimes they actually store their metadata if it's very sparse as JSON objects, as JSON blobs inside the database. And so again, um, the interesting thing is the one thing that NoSQL database have done is basically taught Postgres and MySQL that they need to add better support for JSON. And they've done, and now they actually often provide a lot better support for even indexing and validation on JSON than many of the NoSQL databases. Does this work with other databases, specifically Oracle and or Sybase? Uh, well, uh, the, so the question was, does it work with databases like Oracle and Citus? So Citus, uh, Cybase. Just, Cybase. Oh, Cybase. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, so Timescale itself is, is, is an extension built on Postgres. It's actually quite integrated into Postgres. Um, so Timescale needs to be deployed with Postgres. Um, Postgres itself has a fairly nice way to connect to other databases via this interface called the Postgres Foreign Data Wrapper which basically exposes to one database what looks like a table that's actually a remote table connected via RPC. And so what that means is I could actually, I described a relational table in your same database. That relational table could in fact be in a remote database other than time scale, and in fact could be joining across that via the uh, Postgres FDW interface. I don't remember the status of FDW connects to Oracle and Sybase. Somebody else in this room might. Can you run on Amazon RDS version of Postgres? Uh, so uh, not yet. Uh, we, uh, on our website, this is a request we often get. We are talking with them. This is m mostly a function of actually uh, RDS basically whitelisting us. We are working with, with uh, Amazon to do this. And we, uh, on our website, you'll, you'll see, a, in GitHub, you'll see a link to the right person to contact um, to push them along. Uh, but. Uh, we expect it to happen in, in, in months. But you could, of course, deploy on EC2, and we give, you know, we have Docker images and installs and RPMs and however other way you want to install. Have you, um, have you discovered any uh, fundamental problems with the Postgres architecture that makes your work difficult? Um, I don't think fundamental problems. So uh, Postgres is uh, one of the things that we take advantage of. So if you think about extensibility of database like Postgres, 
Um, Postgres extensibility, in some sense, is the front end. You could modify the query planner. You could modify the execution engine. You could tie into all that. You could do what we did, kind of change the way that inserts and queries are handled. Um, MySQL takes, for example, a very different approach. MySQL has a constant front end that allows you to have a different storage engine. So typically, that's like inodb or miasm, but you could also plug in your own storage engine. So these two trade-offs have pros and cons. Um, the reason we actually particularly like Postgres is, is that uh, we basically, you know, the thing that takes five, eight years to get mature is the lowest level of data storage and your use of, you know, write-ahead logging and backups and recovery and everything that makes the corner cases really hard. And for that, because we've kind of carefully designed ourselves to some of this is an engineering challenge and how do you bring all these advantages while constraining yourself to some of the ways that Postgres operates internally. Um, that has both obviously sometimes required us to do certain things from an engineering point of view. On the flip side, we felt that be really important so we don't have to rewrite the storage engine and then you know, worry about an off by one error makes your data not recoverable. Um, I think so far we've only had one uh, customer who went silent or one user went silent for a week and then they came back and said, oh, I, I thought it was, you had data corruption and then it turned out to be my vSphere disks that had the corruption and you, were, you guys were okay. So, so I think that has been a, a particular importance of ours. On the flip side is if we allowed ourselves to arbitrarily change our low level storage model, there's other optimizations, storage optimizations we could do. But that's the decision we made so far. <laughs>